everybody is at odds with each other. Everybody is against each other, it seems like. Uh, everywhere you turn. Uh, like Jamie said too, from wearing people being against each other about wearing masks, which I'm guilty, uh, to uh, a lot of race issues going on, to e everything else, you know, just everything else that's been going on in the world today. And uh, uh, I feel like we've kind of got away a little bit from the basics of why we're Christians, why we're here. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people that say that they are Christian. There's a lot of people that say they're followers of God. And some of the people that's had a lot of the negative comments to say have been pastors and preachers. And uh, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Um, in the book of Psalms, I, I've, I've studied, y'all heard me preach and, and teach a little bit. I remember when I first came uh, and done a adult vacation Bible school a few years ago, uh, there was one of the passages that we done that was about sheep that I had talked about. And I've had a few messages about sheep. Uh, I've studied a little bit about, about, about sheep, about shepherds and uh, I believe we're not letting uh, the good shepherd take his role in our lives the way that we're supposed to. That, it, it's just it's obvious that that's not going on. Uh, it's not going on in the world out outside of our church. Uh, and this is something that I feel passionate about. Um, that uh, that God wants me to uh, to talk to you about. Uh, this message is, uh, my text this morning is going to be pretty long, uh, but over the next three weeks, we're going to be in Psalms 22, 23, and 24. Um, this week, uh, we're going to talk about the good shepherd giving his life for the sheep. Um, next week, uh, we're going to talk about the great shepherd providing for the sheep. And we're going to talk about him coming back for his flock. Uh, in Psalm chapter 22, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those to me are heartbreaking words. We, if, we, if you read over in the New Testament, Jesus utters these words from Calvary. This is a prophecy of what's to come. David, David wrote this psalm, but it's a prophecy of what's to come. God was speaking these words, spoke these words to David, and David pinned them down. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, when Jesus uttered those words from Calvary, he was he was heartbroken. In more ways than one, and we'll get to that. Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season am not I silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our Father trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man. A reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me, laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Those right there were the words of the thief on the cross. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me the hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. 
Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Father God, Lord, I just want to thank you today, Lord, for all that you do for us. I want to thank you this morning for Jesus Christ and what he did when he came to this earth, Lord. I pray today, Lord, that you would just, God, use me as a vessel. Speak through me, dear God. Remind me of the things that you've done for me, Lord. Bless our service this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll get to the rest of the verses of that chapter uh, shortly. Uh, throughout the Word of God, it don't matter where you're at, even from Genesis, it points to Calvary. It points to Jesus. There are reflections and images of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Before the first prophet prophesied the coming of the Messiah, before the first prophet prophesied that Jesus would come, there's images of Christ there. There's, there, there's images there. And then we come to the psalm, the psalmist of David. God said he was a man after his own heart, Scripture says. Uh, David was not a perfect human being. He made mistakes. That's why I like David. I can relate to David. Because he messed up. He made some big mistakes. And he made some bad mistakes. But that God still spoke to David. And God still used David through everything he experienced. Everything that he went through. And in this instance right here. God gives David a glimpse of Calvary. He gives him a glimpse of a Savior, a Messiah that's going to come. It's going to this this man is going to come in his own lineage. He is going to be a descendant of David. Christ comes long after David has has died, but he gets a picture of what's going on. And I want to try for a, a few minutes this morning to give you a little bit of the image that David saw as he was penning this scripture. As God gave him the words to say that was going to take place. Because we need to be reminded, I think, of what Christ has done for us. I've heard people talking about persecution. But folks are being persecuted for having to wear masks. Have y'all heard that? It's, it's, it's disgusting. It makes me mad, I'm going to be honest with you, to have to wear a mask. It aggravates me. But I don't feel persecuted. There's some people over the years that can tell you about what persecution was. And having to wear a mask to keep you from getting sick ain't persecution. Jesus was persecuted long before he sacrificed himself, long before he went to Calvary, he was persecuted for what he taught. 
That wasn't the first time that Jesus was beaten. Jesus was stoned. Jesus escaped death before Calvary because it wasn't his time. The Apostle Paul, I believe, knew what persecution was. Amen. When we look in the Word of God, he's probably one of the most persecuted men in Scripture other than Christ. I can't imagine what he would have to say about people complaining about persecution for wearing a mask. I've, uh, I've heard people say before that they feel persecuted on their job side because they're the only Christian there. When they try to tell others, people kind of pick and make fun. Still not persecution. Jesus knew what persecution was. The days leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, uh, many things happened. We've talked about those things. I've preached about them before. Uh, the days leading up and even the hours leading up to when Jesus was apprehended. Jesus was turned over to the Sanhedrin by uh, one of his closest followers, Judas Iscariot. But after that, he was he was beaten. Uh, scripture says in the New Testament, it, it speaks of Jesus being uh, scourged. They took him and attached him to a post and uh, beat him with a, with a whip, cat of nine tails. They would use metal clasp and bones and things of that nature and it would just peel the flesh away from its victims. The way those posts were, were placed, they would tie the victim's arms pretty high to the top of this post. So they were all stretched out and they would uh, commit to, to whipping them and beating them. And then once uh, it was enough, they would unlack, un, un, uh, they, they would take one of their hands loose and roll them over where the front of their body was exposed and they would go at it again. So all of their bodies were covered in these, these wounds. The flesh was, was torn away. And then after that, what happened was Jesus was covered with a, with a robe. They put a robe on him. And, and uh, some time passed. But I want to talk this morning a little bit about the heart of Jesus. And what he was experiencing and what he went through. Let me tell you something. When I read the words of this scripture and I see what David is writing down, when I see what words he's putting down, I, I think about us. I think about you. I think about me. And I think about a time when I read this first verse and he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is saying these words to God the Father. Why have you forsaken me? Have you ever been in a place, have you ever been in an instance, in a situation that you felt like you was all by yourself? There wasn't nobody there to help you. There wasn't nobody there to comfort you. There wasn't nobody there to fix what was going on. I think we've all been in a place where we wanted somebody to fix something. And there was nothing that anybody could do. You know, I, when tragedy strikes in our lives, a lot of times we lose somebody we love. Uh, a lot of people try to have the right words to say. 
And they're terrible at it. All of them. <laughs> nobody knows. Nobody, nobody has, has the words to say. Sometimes it's just about comfort. Feeling like somebody's there for you. Feeling like somebody is just being there for you. In this instance, when Jesus shouted out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He wasn't wanting a rescue. He wanted comfort. He couldn't feel the presence of his Father at that point in time. Because in that instance, in that moment, right then, Jesus decided that he was going to take the sins, not just mine, not just the sins of his disciples, not just the sins of those that were closest to him, not just the sins of his family and his friends, but he chose, he decided that he was going to take the sins of those men that were beating him half to death. Those people that condemned him to death. Those people that brutalized him. Stretched his arms out and nailed him to a cross. He decided then that he was going to take their sins on. He was going to make it like he was the one that was guilty. He decided then and there that he was going to take the sins of those people 2,000 years later that all he wanted was for them to love him. And he knew that they would reject him. He knew that they would be disobedient to him. He took their sins. He took our sins. Amen. You know, you know, I don't, we ain't got to call it out. You know the times in your life when you have been disobedient to God. That you knew that God wanted you to do something. And you just said, nope. Can you think of it? <clears throat> Jesus died for all that. And in the moment that he was hanging on the cross, he looked down, the Bible says, and his bones stared up at him. The flesh was torn away in such a fashion that they were exposed. And in those moments, he was thinking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, Jesus experienced that forsakenness, that loneliness, that heartbrokenness, so that we wouldn't have to. See, the Bible tells us that in every form, Jesus experienced what we experience. He experienced the temptation. He experienced the heartbrokenness. He did all that. You know why he did all that? So he could say, I know what you're going through. I can tell you, it, it's a lot easier to relate to somebody that has been through what you've been through. There's things that uh, some of you have been through that I, I can't relate to. Because I haven't been there. I haven't been in the middle of a war. I know what you experience. I haven't been there. 
I haven't lost a spouse and know what that experience is like for somebody to go to go through. But see, I know somebody that can give us comfort and experience. Jesus went on to say, he said in these verses following, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest me not. And in the night season, and am not silent. He said, I'm praying. God, I'm trying to talk to you. But you ain't hearing me. You ain't listening. You ain't, you ain't listening. You ain't picking up what I'm putting down. That's what Jesus was saying. He felt lonely. Let me tell you, I'm going to tell you all about something that happened in my life that made me realize how important it is, how important this scripture is to me, all right? Years ago, um, I got out of church, all right? I got out of the will of God. I was about as far out as you could get, all right? Heathen, bad. And uh, didn't, didn't have any concern about Church must less be than the will of God. I did. That wasn't my life. I did. I didn't care nothing about that. Well, me and my beautiful wife got married, and she said she wanted to go to church. I said, "Take off." She wanted me to go with her, so I said, "I'll, I'll go to church," and I went. We went for a few years. We were even somewhat active in church, taught a class. I was going and I was just I was just showing up. I was just present. That was it. People would ask me questions. I had knowledge about the Bible. I had answers to some of the questions people asked. Alright? I knew what was going on. I had the gist of everything. I was putting on a pretty doggone good show. Because if somebody came up to me and, man, this joker, he knows a little bit about the Bible, he can answer some questions. That made me look like I had it together. I didn't. I was going through the motions. That was it. And I got to a point to where I was like, all right, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I might as well do it right. So I decided that I wanted to tell I, me, I decided that I was ready to get things right. All these, all this time had passed and I had never forgot about who God was in my life. I had never forgot about what Jesus Christ did for me. But I didn't care. At all. So I decided, I got to a place where I was like, all right, if I'm going to go through the motions, I might as well do it right. All right? I might as well get back to the place that I need to be. And so I would go to church. The invitation would come. And I would pray. And I would talk to God and tell God. I'd say, God, I'm ready. And you know what happened? <clears throat> nothing I never felt God drawing me I didn't feel like there was an ear on the other side of my prayer and there was a period in time where I was terrified because I'm, I'm trying to get things right I'm trying to make things right in my life all right, I'm, I'm trying to do it the right way. And I'm not getting a response from God. I'm not getting an answer 
from God. I ain't getting that. I ain't getting them warm and fuzzies. Like everything's going to be all right. I was scared to death. Because I knew what God was capable of. I knew the power that God had. And I knew exactly what God could do in my life or in the life of somebody that I love. I was scared to death. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm trying, God. I'm doing everything. Started trying to live better. Started trying to act better. Started trying to do right. I was cleaning it up. If you if you notice a lot of the things I'm saying, there's a lot of I in it. <laughs> when I read that scripture, I felt that right there. I felt like I'm crying out to you, God, but you ain't hearing me. You ain't listening. I was scared because I thought, well, I know that there was a time in my life that I gave my heart to Jesus. But right now, I'm calling on God and he ain't, he ain't hearing me. I believe It was a couple years later, we um, went, went through some things and had trouble at, at, our, at the church where we were at. We left our church and we started going to Highlands Baptist Church. And uh, we went there and I, uh, I heard the first Sunday we went, uh, we, were just, we visited, I think it was during a homecoming. The following Sunday we went back and I heard the preacher preach and uh, Brother Jason Gravett. <clears throat> and... Uh, I fell in love with that joker from day one. I was just like, man, he's a nut. I like him. And uh, on our way out, I can't even remember what it was. I remember asking him a question about a song that we sang, and it was biblically related, and he didn't have an answer for me. I'm like, all right, I like this guy, because he didn't blow some smoke and try to tell me something. Over the weeks and months, we continued to go to church there. I remember sitting in the pew and feeling God speak to my heart. And you have no idea what kind of relief that was to me. I believe God allowed me to experience that so I could relate just, just a little bit, just a tiny bit what Christ felt when he was calling out to God. He was crying out. And he, he didn't get that feeling. Felt like he said to me, I've been there. It made me realize how important it is to have a close walk with God. Amen. To have a close relationship with God. Because I didn't ever want that to go away. I didn't ever want that. I didn't ever want to have that feeling that I had felt during that point in time. I didn't want to be that terrified again. See, Jesus experienced and endured the things at Calvary that he did. Not just at Calvary, but through his short life here on earth. He, he endured and he went through and his life was challenged with those experiences so that we would have somebody that we could relate to that has dealt with the burden and dealt with the heartache and dealt with the fear. Jesus, everything about him, he was, he was a humble servant. The Bible says he he referred to himself as a worm, lowest of the low. He said they laugh at me, they laugh at me, they mock me. 
went on to say in verse 11, he said, Be not far from me, for trouble is near. He said, For there is none to help. He felt hopeless. He felt like, When is this going to end? When I look at everything that's going on, I have said those exact words. When is this going to be over? I'm tired of masks everywhere I go, having to wear them. When is this epidemic, not just about the mask, it's about the epidemic. When is this going to be over? Many bulls have compassed me. They gaped on me with their mouths. He said, I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Man. As Christ was on the cross, or preparing to be on the cross, uh, I've, been, I've been studying a lot about the crucifixion lately. Um, uh, they would take a lot of times and pull their arms over into place. Normally there was a uh, pilot hole that was already placed in the cross. And they would stretch their arms out to line them up and uh, the nail would actually go go right, right, right about in there, into the wrist. Not in the palms of the hands like a lot of pictures you see. Uh, and actually, uh, during the, uh, the custom, they considered that a part of the hand. So when he said nails in the hands and feet, it was still possibly there. But the weight of the human body couldn't hold up through the hand. The nail would, would pull through the skin and through the joints. But right there, there was a bone that prevented the nail to pull through. So as Jesus has his arms stretched out on this cross, a lot of times when the nail would go through, it would pierce the nerve and it would cause their hands to, to clench up. So the nails are holding the arms of a Savior on the cross. And he's having to do everything he can to hold his body up as it's pulling at these bones. When he said that all my bones are out of joint, the hips, the legs, the shoulders, the wrists, all those bones were out of joint. As they drove the nail through the feet, through both feet of Jesus, he's also using the weight of his body is being pressed down on those nails and he's trying to he's trying to hold himself up and it was excruciatingly painful for people that were nailed to these crosses to take a breath so they would inhale deeply as they pulled themselves tried to pull themselves up this cross to take a breath. And you can imagine the wounds on his back being exposed and pulling himself up this rough cross to take a breath. As the victim, as Jesus, would slide back down this cross, back into place, he would exhale. And that was when the words would be spoken. There's seven sayings that Jesus spoke from Calvary. There was only seven because it was excruciating for him to do that. It was excruciatingly painful. Y'all know the word excruciating in its Latin form means from the cross? He would utter these words as he slid down the cross. And when he uttered those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
He was heartbroken. His bones stared up at him. He was suffering. He was in pain. The scripture goes on to say that my heart is melted like wax. That's not just to say that he was heartbroken from all the torture that Jesus had been through, from all the pain that he had endured over the last few hours, and from having shortness of breath hanging on this cross, struggling to take a breath, his heart was literally beginning to fail. There's some scientists that have taken the crucifixion of Jesus and tried to do an autopsy as to the what Jesus really experienced when he was on the cross. What he really dealt with and went through. And many of them believe that when he said the, the words that we see in Psalms that his heart was melted like wax was that he was having cardiac trouble from all the suffering. He was literally dealing with a broken heart. So he did those things for each and every one of us. I think we need to refocus. Um, I believe Jamie got it right with that song this morning. We need to pledge our allegiance to the Lamb of God. I believe that we live in the greatest country in the world. But we need to realign our focus on Christ. I'm going to close with these last few verses. Bible goes on to say in verse 23, ye that, or in verse 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. See, Jesus has been suffering. Jesus has been in pain. Jesus is on the verge of death. Regardless of the fact that he wasn't getting an answer to his prayer, regardless of the fact that he was suffering in an excruciating pain, he knew what he was there for. And he said, I will declare your name. It doesn't matter what I go through. It doesn't matter what I deal with. I am going to declare the name of the Lord to the people. He said, Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before him that fear him. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's. And he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship, and they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and just declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done them. Jesus 
in the midst of his pain, in the midst of his suffering, he said, I will declare your name no matter what. No matter what I endure, no matter what I experience, I will declare the name of the Lord. And everything that we're dealing with and everything that we're going through. And people's Facebook posts, Instas, all that. And we're saying things. How are you declaring the name of the Lord in your words, in your actions? I believe that we need to do a better job at declaring the name of the Lord. Every head